It's February 10th, 1996. The current world champion of chess, Garry Kasparov, is about to begin a set of matches against a supercomputer built by a team working for IBM. This team was dedicated enough to prove that AI, or artificial intelligence, could surpass human abilities at chess. In what better way would it be proven than by challenging none other than the reigning champ himself? The computer going up against Kasparov was named Deep Blue, and had the capabilities of evaluating 100 million positions per second. The footage of the matches from 1996 are very scarce, but tons of videos on YouTube are dedicated to replaying and analyzing the individual games. The match started and there was already tension in the air when Kasparov lost the first game to Deep Blue. This was one of six matches that was set to be played over the next couple of days, but after losing the very first match, history was made on that one game alone. This was the first time a computer had beaten a world champion in chess under the rules of standard chess tournament time controls, a huge mark in history, especially considering how many steps it took to get there. Seven years prior in 1989, another computer known as Deep Thought was the first computer to defeat a grandmaster player, Bent Larsen, a Danish player considered the best in Scandinavia until rise of current world champion Magnus Carlsen. The machine has a name, Deep Thought. It's the computer world champion of chess. Kasparov had also faced Deep Thought in 89, which was thought to be the most technologically advanced computer at chess for the time. Kasparov beat the computer convincingly, and probably figured that computers couldn't reach the levels of intelligence and adaptation that humans have. Right? If you were to lose in the next few years to some super machine, what effect do you think the loss by the world champion to a machine will have on chess as a creative, and as a business enterprise. You mean within the next, next so, five years? Yeah. Well, whatever. Okay, thank you. It means that I will be world champion for the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> Years down the line, this is where Kasparov found himself one game down against what he probably innerly feared the most. He adapted the next following days, took the second game and tied the third and fourth game. In chess, both players were rewarded half a point when tying, so the score was now 2-2. In games 5 and 6, Kasparov took both of the matches and won the set 4-2. Not quite the victory for Deep Blue, but two games was definitely proof that it was possible to take down the reigning champion. A rematch would be proposed to Kasparov to take place in May of the following year, and he accepted. This time, Deep Blue was back in full force, now being able to evaluate 200 million positions per second, twice as many as the previous year. The method of evaluating positions is known as the brute force method. This method systematically calculates all possible candidates for the solution and checks whether each candidate satisfies the result. Essentially, by scanning through every possible option, it finds the most optimal for each scenario. The 1997 rematch started out similarly as the 1996 match, with each player taking a game each from the first two matches, this time in the other order. After a sequence of draws putting the match to 2.5 to 2.5, the final match was going to decide it all, and Kasparov looked shook. He was in a bad spot. Deep Blue has led Kasparov into making a poor move. Kasparov is rattled. He defends what he can, but it's clear that the computer will reliably do what he himself would do. And he recognizes that he has already lost. On Deep Blue's 19th move, the champion resigns. Garry Kasparov walked away on that day being defeated by artificial intelligence. And little did we know, this was only the beginning when it comes to the rabbit hole that is AI. Now, I know what you're thinking. What does any of this have to do with speedrunning? Well, in comparison, chess has advanced extremely far technologically as opposed to speedrunning. This is mostly due to speedrunning being a relatively new activity, having been birthed from Doom and Quake demos in the 1990s, as opposed to the legacy that is chess, where you can find traces dating all the way back to 6th century AD. By the time Kasparov lost the Deep Blue, the concept of speedrunning video games as a whole was only a couple of years old, but that wouldn't stop it from taking off in the modern era of Twitch live streaming, live speedrun marathons, and YouTube content. For the untrained eye, speedrunning can look like a magician performing magic tricks. You have no idea what's going on, but you're interested nonetheless. Mesmerized viewers watching their favorite game being torn into pieces will assume it's a one-man effort. In almost every case, it's a community effort. Every community for every game work as a team in what I will refer to as community versus game. The three biggest parts about speedrunning is glitch hunting, routing, 
and optimizing. If a new game just came out today, the first step for the newly founded community of that game would be to find glitches, skips, and shortcuts to help make the run faster. Whether it's wall clips, height exploits, or movement tech, it all counts in the early phases. Once the initial set of glitches have been found, the routing phase begins. If it's a collectathon, say a new Mario game, you have to figure out which stars are the fastest for completing the game as fast as possible. Not only which are the fastest by timing them all individually, but figuring out the best order of approach too. For example, in Super Mario Sunshine, the 120 shines category has notoriously been rerouted over and over again because of the hundreds of possible ways to move between all the stages. Even if you're running a glitchless category, you still have to put a lot of effort into routing the entire game. Finally, it's up to the optimizers, or runners rather, to push the game attempting to get the best time achievable with the most up-to-date strategies. It is fairly uncommon to see a speedrunner or community member excel at all three main tasks when it comes to speedrunning. Most people you see at the top of the leaderboard have their sights set on pure speed, practice routines, and pushing the record lower. Occasionally top-level runners find strategies or make routing changes, but it's clear that optimization is their strong suit. This isn't to say that there aren't exceptions. Some people are good at all three, but it is very rare to find someone who has simply perfected all three main aspects of speedrunning. What if there was somebody that could simply solve an entire game? Only after a month? A week? Maybe even only after a day of trying? Not a person, but a computer. This video won't be me attempting to push a personal belief forward that AI is the future, because in all honesty, I'm as skeptical as you might be, but rather I'd say it serves more as a purpose to raise a question. What if? What if somebody wasn't just amazing at all three, but was perfect? Currently, we already have Tool Assisted Speedruns, or TAS, a way to create a theoretical perfect speedrun. But this is done by actual humans, slowing the game down frame by frame, saving and loading states constantly to get the best possible result. What if it was AI instead of TAS? Instead of it being humans performing inputs manually on each frame, what if artificial intelligence could teach itself to try out every possible outcome to figure out what the fastest route through the game is? We're obviously years away from being able to solve 3D games, but perhaps an AI in 2020 could become a useful tool in optimizing simpler games like stuff on the Atari 2600 or the NES. Could a computer replace a community in computer versus game? Now it's time to talk about a couple of examples where AI have been used in video games for various purposes. Starting with the one video that inspired me to create this one. It's called OpenAI Plays Hide and Seek and Breaks the Game by Two Minute Papers. In the video, there are two hiders and two seekers that have to work together in order to win. All four participants are self-learning AI that learn from improving over time through trial and error, pattern recognition, and data consumption. At first, it's a total mess. All four AI are running around aimlessly until millions of rounds later, the hiders learn to block out the seekers with boxes. After that, the Seekers learn to grab a ramp on the left-hand side to start winning. The Hiders then learn that they too can get to the ramp, but before the round even starts, forcing the Seekers to find an alternative method of getting over the wall. This is where it gets really interesting. In a different scenario, one of the Seekers managed through trial and error to fling itself upwards using the ramp into the back spot where the Hiders were. It's really cool how they came from nothing, but eventually turn into really inefficient speedrun glitch hunters. In another case, one of the hiders managed to chuck the ramp out of bounds, leaving the seekers with no option. Well, maybe they would find an option millions of rounds later, but that's the beauty of it. Oh, and check this out. Do you think couch surfing is cool? Give me a break. This is box surfing. And the scientists were quite surprised by this move, as this was one of the first cases where the seeker AI seems to have broken the game. Feel free to watch this video by 2 Minute Papers in full. It's not that long, and it's very informative. Link is in the description. I recommend watching some of their other stuff on their channel. There's tons of cool AI videos I highly suggest checking out. Next is Mar.io, created by popular Minecraft YouTuber Seth Blang in 2015. Mar.io is a computer program that was created to beat the level Donut Plains 1 in Super Mario World through the process of neural networks, 
neural evolution, and genetic algorithms. In the video, Seth Blain describes how the program started out knowing nothing about the game, even basic information such as holding right makes you go to the end of the level. We currently do have technology that comes extremely close to simulating a human brain, but no computer exists yet that is strong enough to simulate all the millions and millions of individual neurons. So what we have here is something a bit more simple. Not every neuron is being used to fulfill the given task. This can be seen in a simplified map that Seth Bling made, simulating a neural network, where the white squares represent the neurons, the faded white squares are inactive neurons, and the lines connecting everything represent the axons and dendrites just like in a human brain. I highly recommend watching this video in full to see how the evolution of the learning started. It looks confusing at first, but Seth Bling explains the whole layout so it doesn't get overwhelming. This was a really interesting process that felt rewarding to learn about when creating this video, cause I actually knew nothing about this going in. The link to the Mar.io video is also in the description. Next up is a newer entry. Real AI created by the Red Hot BR. Real AI created using reinforcement learning, learned how to play Crash Ball from scratch, and masters the level in just three days, winning 100 Platinum Relic rounds in a row. Crash Ball is a minigame within the party game Crash Bash for the original PlayStation, and the Platinum Relic rounds have the hardest difficulty computer opponents you can face in the game. Crash Ball is more or less just advanced Pong, so the rules are the same keep the balls out of your goal, and knock them into your opponents. I had the pleasure of asking Red Hot a couple questions regarding the AI. I was first curious to ask if he was using something called supervised learning, which is where you can, let's say, play a couple hours of Crash Ball, take the data that you just compiled and feed it into the AI so that it's not starting completely from scratch. The answer was no. Red Hot said specifically that he was curious to see if he could train an AI from scratch with the purpose to eventually try to face human opponents. And so he did. On his Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash theredhotbr, he had a lot of information on screen so you could follow the progress to see how the AI slowly learned over time. He added stuff such as number of games, win rate, milestones, and the best Platinum Relic round streak. The AI would eventually become unbeaten for over 100 rounds in a row, and was ready to face human opponents. Popular Crash Bash streamer Pi tried playing the AI and gave up only after an hour of playing. Red Hot himself also tried challenging the AI for almost 4 hours straight and never took a game. Red Hot also told me that the AI successfully beat humans in a 3v1 scenario, but plays far from perfect. Its ability to block out balls from coming into his own goal is insanely optimal, but his offensive game was almost completely absent. When a ball is close to your cart, you can press the square button to give it an extra kick away from you. If you hit the timing right, the kick refreshes itself indicated by the yellow light on the cart. If you miss the timing, you're punished by not being able to use the kick for a couple of seconds. Real AI would often just spam this kick whenever possible, with little to no strategy. Even without using the kick correctly at all, however, the AI reigned supreme. Lastly, I asked if he planned on tackling other minigames within Crash Bash, and he says he will attempt to do so in the future. So go ahead and drop him a follow for some potential future AI shenanigans, but he's also an extremely skilled speedrunner in his own right at multiple games, so be on the lookout for that. I could be here all day mentioning examples, but this last one in my opinion is the most notable. This has more to do with the side of reinventing a meta and optimizing games. In April 2019, the world champion team of Dota 2, OG, was challenged by OpenAI 5 to a best of 5. OpenAI 5 is a full Dota 2 team of AI with a limited hero pool of 17. Two Minute Papers, who I mentioned earlier in the video with the hide and seek game, also made a really great video covering this topic, but I will try to sum it up for you. OG got demolished. Throughout the draft and the game itself, the AI would often post updates to what they calculated their win rate to be. A bit cocky, but calculated. The longer the game went on, the win rate only seemed to get higher, and by the end, it was often 95%. Buybacks are a mechanic in Dota 2 where you can revive yourself by paying a sum of gold. This is usually not worth it, especially in the earlier stages of the game where gold is valuable for purchasing items. OpenAI 5 would use buybacks frequently to get themselves into the battlefield, despite it always being viewed as a poor choice from human players. It's kinda interesting how AI could possibly question how pro games are being played. OpenAI 5 also played absurdly aggressive and was really good at decision making, especially when choosing whether a fight was worth it or not. While the world champion team put up a good fight in game 1, the AI cranked the knob big time in game 2 and won in 21 minutes. A solid 2-0 victory for OpenAI 5, 
which really cements how efficient AI can be at video games, taking down the best team in the world. In a similar fashion, I would love to see what would happen if an AI ran through a simple video game millions of times with the goal to beat it as quickly as possible. Imagine a world where an AI could actually achieve the world record. Imagine a world where you could watch an AI learn a speedrun from the ground up to where it eventually becomes just like watching a regular human do attempts. Imagine going into an AI's Twitch stream, wishing him the best of luck, and the AI goes, Yo, thanks for the good luck, my man. Well, it wouldn't quite turn out like that, but anyway. I think the scariest part in all of this AI stuff is the concept of routing. If AI surpass human abilities one day in speedrun routing, we will literally have solved video games. Sequence breaks otherwise thought impossible could become a reality if you give an AI millions of attempts to learn from, and it could possibly kill the essential spirit of the sport. I've questioned the idea that, if this video becomes widespread enough, could it kickstart a renaissance in AI technology for speedrunning, and years down the line, will I be the person responsible for partially killing the routing aspect of speedrunning? I mean, probably not, it's a crazy theory, but butterfly effects can go pretty far. But speaking of going far, I do hope that AI goes far. I'm genuinely interested to see what's doable in speedrunning with the help of AI. Red Hot let me in on his most recent project, and this might be, don't quote me on it, the first time AI is going to be useful in speedrunning. He created an AI that can recognize the digits of the font in Crash Team Racing. This means that in a full 80% warpless run, all of the lap times can be added together by the AI to form your full in-game time for the run, without having to go back to manually write them all down. Maybe other small projects could spawn from this video. One thing I'd love to see is starting straight from the roots such as seeing if an AI could get the world record on Dragster for the Atari 2600, which is one of the most straightforward games with an 18-way tied world record at 5.57. I'm no computer scientist or programmer, pretty much everything I talked about in this video I knew nothing about without a lot of research, so I have no idea how difficult or time-consuming it would be to create an AI that could actually benefit speedrunning greatly. Excuse my ignorance, this is out of my field. But I know so many smart speedrunners and glitch hunters that probably would love to say that they were the first to use an AI to help aid further optimization in our beloved world of speedrunning. The only question is when. Starting with Dragster would be a huge step and is something I'd love to witness in my lifetime. The world of AI is currently limited and limitless. What's possible is only being held back by computational power, and to some extent, limited creativity. I think AI has a bright future ahead of itself. Seeing how far AI made it in the world of chess gives me hope. Sure, a team was being funded to work on an AI full time, but within a short time span, dedication led to huge progress and a monumental moment nobody could have seen coming. Perhaps in our lifetime, we will witness something similar to Kasparov losing to Deep Blue. Like the Super Mario Bros world record being broken by an AI. Artificial intelligence does not suffer from negative drawbacks when it comes to speedrunning such as burnout or hand pain, so it quite literally is the ultimate being, theoretically anyway. With all the crazy stuff speedrunners have managed to find so far, I wouldn't be surprised if AI was simply the next step. For the future of artificial intelligence, some will say fear of the unknown. I'll say bring your best technology. Bring your best. But if computer beats one day, mm, I don't know what will happen. <laughs>